I want you to turn in your Bibles to the, uh, uh, the, the third chapter of Revelation, and we're going to look at what our Lord has to say to the church of Laodicea. Beginning at verse 14, we read these words. <coughs> Write to the angel in Laodicea, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say that you are rich. Uh, you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, and white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers... I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, we've been studying these seven churches, and of course you know that some of them were good, some of them were bad, Churches like Smyrna and Philadelphia, uh, they, were, uh, they were churches that the Lord commended, and he didn't rebuke them. But uh, all the other churches, he found serious flaws in them. And the church that we are about to consider tonight has gotten so far away from the Lord that uh, the Lord says he wanted to just vomit them out of his mouth. They made him sick. That's a terrible indictment upon any church. Now, there are actually three ways that we can look at these letters. First, we can look at them practically. Ephesus was the church that left her first love. Then Smyrna was the suffering church, and they were very poor, and yet the Lord says that they were very rich. Then there was Pergamos. This was the church that compromised the faith. And then there was Thyatira that uh, tolerated apostasy within the church. And Sardis was called a dead church. Philadelphia was found to be a faithful church. And Laodicea is a lukewarm church that the Lord wants to vomit out of his mouth. And then we can look at these, uh, the, these passages of Scripture relating to these seven churches prophetically because they are representatives of the entirety of the church throughout the past 2,000 years. Number seven, meaning complete. The, the complete church is represented by these seven churches. In other words, they speak to each local church, but they also have prophetic undertones which expands beyond the churches of John's day right up unto our present day, the day in which you and I live. So these are the ways that we can look at them. Then there's personally, we can look at it as well. These letters speak to each individual, to every Christian, to every church that reads them. They have a word for each of us as individuals, and they have a word for us as a congregation. So that's why it's, it's really helpful and beneficial for church, for church people to go back to look at this passage of Scripture again and again and again and see what does 
he have to say to speak to my heart? What does he have to say to speak to my church that I am a part of? Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the history. The city was founded by Antiochus II uh, sometime before 253 B.C. It was named after his wife, Laodicea. Uh, incidentally, um, yeah, he was married to th this woman for a very short period of time, but time enough to name a city after her, but then uh, within a matter of two years, he dismissed her. That's another way, way of saying he divorced her. He got rid of her, and he married a woman by the name of Bernice that was the daughter of uh, Tal one of Ptolemy's daughters. The city was located on a high plateau. It was very secure from enemy attack. This city had one major problem, however, defensively. Now, <coughs> can you imagine when they built the city, they never really gave any consideration to the water supply. And the city was built without any water supply within the city. The water had to be brought in by aqueducts from 10 miles away or 6 miles away. 6 miles it was to Hierapolis, 10 miles to uh, Colossi. That's where they got their water from. Now, water, uh, cold water came from Colossi, 10 miles away, and hot water came from the springs. These were uh, hot springs from Hierapolis up in the mountains where people, mostly the wealthy people, went uh, to um, take baths in these, these uh, hot springs because they believed they had uh, medical uh, benefits medicinal benefits. Remember this because it's important for our understanding of the passage that we have before us. Another historical fact is that Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake in 61 AD. And uh, can you imagine, the totally devastated the whole city. And um, Rome offered to help rebuild the city and the people of Laodicea refused the help from the government. They paid for the complete reconstruction of the city with their own money. So they're a very wealthy, wealthy city. The city was famous in its day for three primary characteristics. First of all, it was a financial center, a center of banking and finance. It was known throughout the Roman Empire for its wealth and financial power. That's why they thought themselves rich, remember? One of the things that Jesus said about them, you think you're rich. And another thing that they were known for was fashion. This was, this was um, <coughs> Paris, France of the day, uh, the place of, of great fashion. It was renowned for its soft black, black wool that was produced there. They had these uh, 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 breed of sheep that were black, black sheep and uh, very shiny fur. And uh, the wealthy were able to uh, have coats, like, uh, like instead of a mink coat, it would be a coat made out of black material from these sheep. And wool was used in clothing making and also in rub rug manufacturing. Laodicea was the center of fashion in its day. And then the third thing that it was known for is its pharmaceuticals. Uh, there was a famous medical school located in Laodicea which produced a tablet. And this tablet was sold throughout the Roman Empire. And what they would do is they would take this tablet and they would crush it. And then they'd mix a little water with it. And they would make a salve out of it. And it was used for, for healing eye diseases. And we, they believed that it was, um, it did remedy many uh, eye afflictions. So, uh, so these three things, finances, fashions, and pharmaceuticals. So now with this background in mind, we want to consider these verses and our Lord's words of condemnation and warning to this church. First, let's look at the problems in Laodicea. Jesus comes to this church 
with a single word of, with, without a single word of commendation. Nothing, he could not find one thing that he could hold up and rejoice over, give praise about, or give thanks for. There was not one word of commendation. He has nothing good to say to this church. He simply comes to them and he lays out the problems as he sees them. Remember, he's, uh, he, he's been walking in the midst of these churches. He says, I know you. He knows all about them. So he knows what's going on in the church, and he knows what's going on in the life of each and every individual. First, there is the problem that we see of possessiveness or possession. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, look at verse 14. He says, right to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Now, that's what my version says. Uh, I think uh, in other versions, it's of Laodicea. And uh, the King James Version, it seems that in all the other churches that he speaks to, when he comes to them, he says the church of Thyatira in Thyatira the church in Smyrna, the church in Ephesus. But when he comes to this church, he says the church of instead of in. Now, that's a big difference. If you stop and think about it, uh, what is the difference? Well, it shows that they were um, uh, very possessive about their church. Um, This is, you've heard people say that this is my church. This is my church. Well, uh, is it your church or is it the Lord's church? Uh, Are we, uh, but but you know that this matter of ownership uh, is quite prevalent in churches in many places. I've pastored some of them um, who thought that they had ownership of the church. Um, I, I can remember a church that uh, they had the, how many of you are familiar with the old red hymn book? (laughs) The old red hymn book. Well, this church had this old red hymn book that they had been using that book probably for 50 years or more. And they were falling apart at the seams. And uh, one of the gentlemen that attended the church, he was a former pastor of the church, uh, his wife had died, and uh, he uh, came to me with an idea. He said, you know, uh, our church could really use some new hymn books. And uh, I said, gee, I agree 100%. They're falling apart at the seams. And uh, I said, well... uh, you know, how much, figure out how much they cost. He said, well, I want to donate. I want to donate the money in memory of my wife. And I said, well, that's a pretty good idea. Uh, That's a wonderful thing. We we can pay tribute to your wife. She was a godly woman, wonderful saint. And he said, "Uh, I'd just like to have a little uh, note in 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 the front of the hymn book, her name, place there that this was in honor and in memory of my wife. So I said, well, let's take it to the church. And we brought it, of course, in our church, we had to bring it before the board of trustees because they were in charge of all the properties of the church. So uh, we brought it before the board and they thought it was a great idea. And we're going to get some new hymn books and they put it up for a vote and the church voted on it unanimously that we get new hymn books. Well, I thought it was just, an, that's the end of it. We're getting new hymn books. And lo and behold, uh, a week or so later, I get a phone call from a woman who said that, uh, Mr. Richter, uh, uh, I, I need to talk to you. I'd like for you to come to, to visit me and my husband. And she told me where they were. I had never seen this woman before. But she was, when I got there, She introduced herself, told me that they were members of the church years ago, but they'd moved to Florida. But they still loved the church, and uh, 
they wanted me to understand that the hymn books that they had in the church presently had the name of their mother who had donated, they had donated those hymn books 50 years earlier in memory of her. And they, she said to me, um, Mr. Richner, are you going to play ball with us or are you not? And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, if you allow those hymn books to come into this church, she says, I'm going to see to it that you get not one dime, she said, out of our inheritance. And we're, we're planning on leaving sixty to $70,000 to your church. Ownership. Talk about people who have a sense of ownership. And uh, I said, well, <laughs> ma'am, I'm sorry, but I guess I'm not on, the, on your team because uh, our church has already voted. And it's unanimous. The church wants to have new hymn books, and I'm afraid they're coming in. Well, that <laughs> they were so upset about that that they actually wrote to my district supervisor, overseer of our churches, and saying I wouldn't play ball with them. And they thought I, they, I'd be sent to another church. Well, you know, it wasn't too much longer after that that I decided I needed to go to another, <laughs> another, another church. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> uh, there was this, this problem of possessiveness on the part of the people. And... We have to remember why the church exists. We have to remember who it was that founded the church. Jesus said that to Peter, upon this rock, I, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So this is not our church. It's God's church. He's the one who brought it into existence. He's the one that oversees it. He's the one that, that gives it life and vitality. And, and, and so we need to remember that. I've seen churches split over fighting over what color paint we should have in the sanctuary. Uh, very sudden, such petty nonsense. He is the one that died for the church. He gave his life for it. He purchased it. He says, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are here for him. We are here to lift him up, to praise him. Our duty is to preach him, to praise him, to publish him. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And then the second problem was the problem of passion. They lost their passion for Christ. And Jesus tells them that like that water in the city, they have become lukewarm. Lukewarm. Remember that water problem I told you about earlier? Water from the hot springs of Hierapolis? Well, they had to come down the mountain. It started out up in the mountain at the springs. They were hot springs. And it, the water was very hot when it left that mountain. And then it went down through Aqueduct over a period of, uh, of uh, over uh, about six miles down the mountain. And so by the time it reached the city of Laodicea, it was very tepid. It was lukewarm. And then... Uh, the cold water, on the other hand, came from Colossae, which was 10 miles to the east. And it also came through aqueducts. But by the time the cold water got to the city, it was also lukewarm because it was exposed to the, 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 the sun. So cold water from Colossae was piped in, but... By the time it reached there, it was lukewarm and it was impossible to get a refreshing drink of water in Laodicea. 
the church had taken on the characteristic of the water supply in the city. In other words, they lost their passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. They had become indifferent. They had grown apathetic. They had reached a place where they were going through the motions of religion, but they were unmoved by the things of the Lord, and they were devoid of spiritual power. You know, you can understand why the Lord was so uh, irate and so upset with this, this church because of their apathy, their indifference. My daughter, uh, who uh, is greatly responsible for all putting all these uh, slides together for me, uh, and I thank the Lord for her. She's been a teacher uh, in one of our school systems uh, for the past seven years in Bellevue. And uh, she was sharing with me, in fact, uh, as we were talking about this particular slide, uh, she said, that, that's just about how I feel, she said, every day. Because she said, uh, the kids today, since COVID, uh, have just become so disinterested in school. They don't want to learn. They don't, they don't, you can try every trick up my sleeve. She says, I, I've uh, done everything that I possibly could to give them individual attention. I've changed the curriculum, tried to make it more interesting. Uh, so, and she says, and yet 75% of the class will sit and uh, be on their, their iPhones uh, or on their tablets, watching videos, uh, texting each other in class. And this goes on throughout the whole, the whole period. Every day, she said, I've had to put it. So she's just recently tendered her resignation after seven years of schooling. But she, she said, I just had it. Now uh, she's going to find something else. Because of the apathy, the indifference, uh, that we see. She said, more and more expectations are expected of the teachers, while less and less expectations are expected of the students. And um, the, they, they, they want us, she said, to pass everybody, uh, not give them any uh, failing marks, just pass them. Uh, so that's what, y y you can see this uh, filtering all through society today, this apathy, this indifference. And it's just another characteristic of the age in which you and I live. Now, the prescription for Laodicea, uh, in other words, the, the cure for these problems in the Laodicean church comes in the form of a divine appearance. Now, I want you to note how Jesus appears to this church in verse 14. He says, Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, he comes to them as the confirming one. He comes as the one who says, I am the amen. I am the amen. Now, amen is actually a Hebrew word that means so be it. What I am about to tell you, I'm the amen, and you can bet your bottom dollar that that's exactly the way it's going to be. So be it. Let it be so, or it is so. It was used to express the idea of faithfulness and truth. In other words, he's showing us that he is God. And he is a faithful and true God. And what he says, he means exactly what he says. Now, why don't you go to Isaiah uh, 65, verse 16. <clears throat> Isaiah 65 and at verse 16. Whoever asks for a blessing 
in the land will ask for a blessing by the God of truth. And whoever swears in the land will swear by the God of truth. And then go to uh, Deuteronomy 7. And in verse 9, he says, Know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. Isn't it wonderful to know that we have a God that is faithful? God keeps his word. God keeps his promises. God keeps his covenants. All these things that God has promised us are yea and amen. When, <coughs> excuse me, when we use it to end our prayers, we are saying, when we say amen, we're saying, let it be so. Let it be so. It is a word of confirmation and finality. When Jesus comes to this church, he comes as God's final word to humanity. He comes as the confirmer of all God's promises. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and then verse 20. It says, for all the promises of God, all of them, you can take them to the bank. You need to study the promises of God. Memorize as many of those promises as you can because they are a, a, an encouragement to you in times of trouble and times of difficulty. He says, all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. That's the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. In other words, Regardless of how this church saw itself, Jesus comes to tell them the truth about themselves. He comes to have the final say. And then second, he comes as the confronting one. He says, I am the faithful and true witness to the church. Had a, uh, this church had a flawed uh, view of itself. They thought too highly of themselves. Jesus wants them to know that he knows them as they really are. And he has come to reveal their true state. Their testimony lied about him. And he comes to set the record straight. So he comes as the confirming. He comes as the confronting one. And he comes as the controlling one. What is, where, where do we get that? It says, he is called the beginning of the creation of God. Did you note that in verse, uh, verse 14? It says, thus says the aim and the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Now, that's how it is in my version. I don't know how it is in yours. And I believe it's probably the beginning of the creation of God if you've got a King James Version Bible. Now, that kind of gives us a... Uh, a, a, a different idea of God. If you take that as the, the first begin, it called the beginning of the creation of God, that Jesus is presenting himself as the beginning of the creation of God, that is uh, where the Jehovah Witnesses come in and they say, you see, it says that Christ is the beginning of the cre God's creation. In other words, that Jesus must be the first created being of God that God created because he's the beginning of the creation. But that's not the idea that the Greek is trying to imply here that he had a beginning because our Lord Jesus is without beginning and without ending of days. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. But in Colossians 1, if you go there, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, And a chapter, uh, chapter one, I believe it is. <coughs> yeah, verse 15. Colossians 1, beginning at verse 15. Oh, you should have it up on the slides. He is the image. This is speaking of Jesus. And Paul is writing to the Colossian church. And he is saying that he is the image, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him. 
You see, follow me? He, everything. Can you imagine that? I, I don't know what kind of Jesus you have. Some people's Jesus is just too small. My Jesus is pretty big. He's so big that he was able, he created all things. By him, these worlds came into existence. He, from the control center of heaven and his throne, he cast the stars and the, the sun and the moon into their orbits. He's a great God. He's a big God. He says, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. He is a great and glorious God. He is our creator. He is the source of all things. That's what it means. Or the originator of all things. In other words, Laodicea, I just want you to know who's in charge here. I'm in charge. I'm the controller of all things. I've got my hand on the wheel. He's the controlling one. This is to identify him as the creator and controller of all things. And then he gives a prescription for Laodicea. And it came in the form of a divine appearance. And secondly, it comes in the form of a divine announcement, or actually several announcements. In verse 15 and 16, I want you to go there and read them with me. In verse 15, he says... I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you right, right out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, 15 and 16. In verse 15 and 16, our Lord states, first of all, his desire for this church. God has a desire for this church, as well as all churches. God has a desire for our church here. And, and, and our desire is to be lifting him up. He wants us to glorify him. Desire for this church, Jesus tells the church, he wants them to be either hot or be cold. One or the other. I don't want you to be lukewarm. No, he said, you're lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out, spit you right out of my mouth. He wants his church to be a place where people can find healing. You know, uh, uh, I want you to be hot like those hot springs up in Hierapolis where people go for healing. That's what they go there for. They, they go to those springs because they want to be healed of whatever affliction they may have. And I want my church to be a place of healing. I want you to come to the church for healing. It's a hospital where sick people can be attended to and made well. And then he says, like a trip to the hot springs, and he wants his church to be a place where they can be refreshed by his presence and through worshiping him. He wants us to be like a, a, a cold glass of water, a refreshing drink, something refreshing where people feel refreshed, where they, people feel fed and nurtured and strengthened and encouraged. And then we note the Lord's disgust with the church. He says because of their condition, he's going to spit them right out of his mouth. And that's a strong word in the Greek, that word that is used for spit. It means to vomit. It means to throw up. And that's why we have the, the, the slide up there. I, I hope it's up there. <laughs> I can't see what's behind me. So I, 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 I hope they're keeping up. Jesus is saying to Laodicea, you make me want to vomit you out of my mouth. He cannot tolerate such indifference and such apathy. He's through with them. Then note our Lord's description of the church in verse 17. In verse 17 says, for you say, this is their opinion of themselves. This is how they looked at themselves and evaluated themselves. He said, for you say that I am rich and I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You see, they were proud, so proud of their achievements. Jesus calls them wretched, which means troubled or miserable, which means to be pitied. 
They were proud of their wealth. Jesus tells them that they are actually poor. This word means to be destitute and reduced to begging. They were destitute. Then they thought themselves to be rich. They were proud of their vision. They had of themselves. And Jesus tells them they are blind. They were proud of their fashion, their fine clothes. And Jesus tells them, you're naked. You're naked and exposed. They were totally exposed. And then next, he comes and makes a divine advertisement. He tells them, the church, exactly where they can find all that they need. And, uh, and, and what he does is, is he points them to himself. Come, come to me. Look at 17 and 18 again. He says, I advise you to buy from me. So come to me. If you, want, if, you, if you want to deal with the problems that you're having in this church, you've got to come to me. And he says, I'm going to get you on the gold standard. He says, if you will come to me and put me first in your life and live out my word, then you will know true riches. You will have real, real value, things that really count. He calls them to get on the spiritual gold standard and live out a genuine faith before a lost world. They might see their wealth disappear down here, but they will be laying up for themselves treasures in heaven. And let's look at that passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6. This is a, a, a beautiful passage of Scripture out of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, uh, believe it or not, there, there, there are churches that tell us that the, this Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians to live up to this standard today. That uh, this is for uh, when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom here on earth, during the millennial kingdom, then we'll live by those standards. Well, that's a lot of hogwash. Uh, it, it, go to what Jesus says. Listen to what Jesus said. He, Jesus said to his disciples, go and teach what I have taught you, go and teach likewise. Go and teach others what I have taught you. And Jesus is teaching us here in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning at verse 19. He says, don't, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So, my friend, I, I encourage you to start laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Lay them up there. And we're, we're so inclined to be so earthly minded, so earthly centered and it's just more and more and more. And, and I think even in the church we're finding that people are caught up in this trap of worldly things, worldly possession, focused on the things of this world. But Jesus said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For he that loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Then he says, come to me, if you want to be clothed, I know you like those black fur coats. Uh, he said, I know you like that. I know you like those things. You know, you, you, you're so proud of your fashion, you, the latest fashion, uh, dressed in the... And it was only the poor people that could afford those, those uh, coats. And uh, he says, but you need to... Come to me if you want to really get clothed in the proper clothing. He invites them to adorn themselves in spiritual garments. Those are the things that count as far as he's concerned. This is an invitation to come to him for salvation. Because when you come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he clothes you with his righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so we are dead in trespasses and sins. But when we come to him for healing of our spiritual man, that's salvation. Come into Christ and you'll receive those robes 
of righteousness that come from the Lord Jesus Christ. They were naked and they were lost in their sin. But if they will come to him, he will clothe them in the robes of righteousness and they will no longer be naked and they will no longer be exposed in the sight of God. And then he says, come for spiritual vision. You have your eyes salve for healing for your eyes. That's for your physical eyes, your natural eyes. But you need to come to me so for, for your spiritual vision. He invited them to come to him so that he could restore their spiritual vision. When spiritual vision is restored, then they will become able to see themselves as they really are. And they will want to be able to, to, uh, to have the, uh, a remedy for their situation. They will want to be healed and clothed. This will lead them to repentance, obedience, and humble service. Yes, we need to have spiritual vision. <coughs> and then Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And he says these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 at verse 4. He says, To whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, the God of this world, that's another name for Satan. He's called the God of this world. And Satan is in the business of blinding people's eyes so that they do not see. Note also Luke 4, 18, where Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, and to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus comes to open blind eyes. He comes to restore our vision. And then next he gives them some spiritual advice in verse 19. Verse 19 of Revelation chapter 3. And <clears throat> in verse 19 we read these, these words. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. <coughs> yes. He says, as many as I love. That's a word of compassion. Now, you think that uh, after Jesus gives his view of this church and tells them what they really are, how they're wretched, naked, pitiful, poor, uh, lukewarm. God has smoothed them out of his mouth. Now he comes and he gives them some advice and he starts out with a word of compassion. He says, as many as I love, you see, he still loves them. And that's the wonderful thing about, about the Lord is he doesn't just write them off. He doesn't go zap, let's get rid of them. Let's move on. No. He says, those whom I love. I love you. I love you, Laodicea, the church of Laodicea. I want you to know that I love you. I care about you. I'm concerned about your eternal welfare. I want what's best for you. In spite of their indifference toward him. In spite of their apathy, he still loves them. Such a wretch as I, you know. I think of, when I think of who I am and what I was before I found Jesus Christ, what a wretch. And to think that he loved me in spite of it, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in that state of separation, dead, dead in trespasses and sins, he loved us, gave himself for us. So Jesus just doesn't write people off when they do not do as he wishes them to do. But he calls them. 
And he continues to beckon them, to love them, even when they reject him and they reject his love. He goes on loving them. And then he gives them a word of caution. He says, I rebuke and chasten. I love you, but I'm going to rebuke and I'm going to chasten you. Jesus tells them and he tells us that just because he loves us like we are, he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. God wants to see change in our life. He doesn't want to just give us a ticket to heaven just to escape the fire. No. He wants to, I love this verse, <clears throat> I use it, I, I remind myself of it many times. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He doesn't give up on us. No matter how many times we fail him. Because he loves us. But in an effort to get our attention, he will use two methods to turn us to him. The first comes the rebuke. What's that? Well, it's the conviction. He'll convict us of our sins. Or correct us of our sin. He will send his word into our hearts. And he will convict us in our hearts through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Go to John's Gospel. <coughs> John 16. Beginning at verse 7. John 16, beginning at verse 7. He says, nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. This is Jesus telling his disciples that he was going to leave them. He was going back to the Father. But he said that it's necessary for me to go away. <laughs> It is for your benefit that I go away because if I don't go away, the counselor or the Holy Spirit or the paraclete will not come to you. If I go, however, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict. That's his job. He convicts the world about sin. Righteousness. He convicts the world about righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And so the, the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit is to, to convict us when we step out of line. When we walk in disobedience to God's word, the Holy Spirit comes in. Hey, you better get back on, uh, on the straight and narrow. Better get back on track here. Then <laughs> he says, uh, if we fail to heed his rebukes or his conviction, then he will use a more direct method. The word chasten. That's, that, that means to correct with blows. Ooh, 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 I don't know about you, but I don't like to come under those blows. Remember when Jonah stepped out of line and he got down in the bale, belly of that whale and he says he felt all thy billows and waves were over me. And man, did I begin to pray. He began to pray. He prayed like he never prayed before. We, we don't like those blows, but he may touch any area of our life in order to get our attention. And in some, unbelievable, uh, you may think it's unbelievable, but when, he, when it comes to the Lord's table, he said that there are some that are sweeping. 
because they did they they drank of this cup and ate of my body unworthily, and so he had to take their life. There is a sin that says, I, I don't ask you to pray for it, but there is a sin unto death. So we have to be very cautious about when we disobey God. And Paul was very fearful concerning his own life. He said that when I preach to others, I, I worry about myself becoming a castaway. He didn't want to be put on the shelf. He wanted to be faithful to the Lord. Those who refuse to walk in God's path, we encounter trouble in our lives. <clears throat> Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, that your days may be long upon the face of the earth that the Lord has given you. So, so there's warnings there for our, for our instruction. And then he gives them a word of counsel. He says, be zealous and repent. Now, the word zealous means to come to a boil. Jesus wants this church to get zesty, come alive, get on fire for him. When they see the need and turn to him, it will manifest itself in true repentance. There will be a change of mind that results in a change of direction. And then finally, we're going to, we're going to close this with, the, with a great promise. And this passage from 20 and 21, let me, let's go there, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, it's a very familiar verse of Scripture. It's preached probably more than any other verse of Scripture in the Bible. And multitudes of people have uh, actually come to the Lord Jesus Christ. My father, uh, incidentally, <coughs> was brought to the Lord by reading this chapter, this third chapter, of Revelation, and he was uh, sitting in his living room. He was at the age of 26 years of age at this time. This was before I was even born. But he was sitting in the living room, and he had a can of beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other, and he had his Bible in his lap. And he, he, he shared this with me one day. He was a, a, a janitor for the high school that I go to. And, and he called me in his office one day and he shared with me. He said, did I ever tell you about how I came to the Lord? He thought that I needed to hear this message at that time because I certainly was a very rebellious kid. <laughs> but anyway, he said, well, I, I, I was reading the, the Bible and uh, he said, but I, I usually got, had a hard day's work on the farm where he was working. And uh, he said, I would read my Bible every night. And he said that I was reading in this, this chapter. And he said, I, I came to that verse, that 20th verse. Uh, uh, and behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And he said, I, I, I fell asleep. And uh, while I was sleeping, he said, I had a dream. And I dreamt that he said that there was somebody at the door, knocking at the door. And I got up and he said, I went to the door and opened the door. And he said, there was, a, 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 there was this long robed man standing with a long robe, long hair. And he said that, uh, he said, won't you let me in? And he said, and then he said, I woke up. And he said, I found myself standing in the doorway. And he said, I, I see a, a figure walking away from me. And he said, he said, I never saw anything like this. He said, I was scared. And, uh, uh, he said, scared to death. But he said, I, 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 I knew that it was God was speaking to my heart. I fell on the floor before him and I asked him to save me from my sins. He said, I gave up smoking, gave up drinking. I haven't drunk, never drank or smoked since. And that was his testimony. He said, I, I, I told the pastor of the church where he was going about what had happened to me. And he said, well, George, please don't tell anybody about that. They'll think you're crazy. <laughs> They'll think you're crazy. But that, but that was his experience. And that's how he came to the Lord. So our Lord has a, has a marvelous promise. It's a, it's a present promise. He says, I stand at the door and knock. Now, it, it's also important to understand here that, that Jesus is speaking to the church. He's speaking to the church of Laodicea. And by this time, he is outside of the church. 
they didn't want him in there. So they put him out. You see, he's on the outside of the church looking in, and they're on the inside looking out. And he's saying, I'm standing here at the door of your church. And uh, is it William Hunt, the, 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 the artist that drew the picture of Jesus standing at the door? His name was Hunt. I forget his first name. But you'll notice that he didn't put a handle on the door. If you ever look at that picture, See, see that picture? There's no handle on the door. It means it has to be open from the inside, you see. It has to be open from the inside. And he's saying, just, just one person is all it takes. If any man, if any man, he says, I stand at the door and knock in an effort to get back into this church, Jesus is standing there and knocking. These verbs are in the present tense. And therefore, it could be stated this way. Behold, I am continually standing at the door, and I am continually knocking on the door. In other words, he never gives up in an effort to enter our lives and the lives of people that he loves. It is also a personal promise. He says, if any man hears my voice and opens the door. Jesus does not need for the whole church to get on fire so that he can come in. He merely needs just one person to hear him and open the door. Jesus is a gentleman. He will never knock the door down. He will call, but he will not break down the door. It has to be opened by an act of the will. And then it is a very precious promise. He said, if you open the door, I will come in to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. This is an invitation to sit down and have a leisurely meal with the Savior. He wants to talk to you. He wants to have intimate relationship with you. He wants to have intimate fellowship with you. And it is a powerful promise. This verse is a promise that all the benefits of salvation will be given to you, to the one that overcomes. That person will become identified with Jesus. Look at verse 20, 21. Verse 21 says, To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Yes, those who come to Jesus are promised that they will sit down on the throne with him. Can you imagine that? He says when he comes to set up his kingdom, he's going to have his throne. Right now, he shares the throne of heaven with the Father. He sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. But when he comes, he's going to have his own throne. And he's going to invite you and me to come and share his reign with us. And when it says that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, that's the place of authority. It's the place of rulership. And he's going to give you shared rulership with him in his kingdom. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises that your promises are yea and amen. We can trust in them, count on them, stake our lives upon them, Father. And we look forward for that glorious day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and reigns over the entire world as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And we're going to get to share that joy with him. And we praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.